This is Mark Guerrero. Welcome to East LA Music Stories, episode 15. My guest is Eddie Delgado, uh, who back in the 60s, when dinosaurs were roaming the earth along with us. They were our pets. That's right. But um, you were in a band called the Ambertones, and you are also a Delgado brother. You're not in the current band, but your brother's with... Uh, Bobby and Danny Delgado, who were in the exotics in the 60s, and then uh, Steve, Joey, who are in the current Delgado Brothers with Bobby, and, and Jimmy. There's a lot of Delgado Brothers, all musicians, but you're the eldest, right? Don't rub it in. <laughs> you're the, you're the yeah. oldest one, right? You're yeah, El yeah. Mas Viejo. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, somebody's got to do it, you know. <laughs> And now I, I take pride in kind of getting them inspired up. All those guys, I kind of, they looked at me like, well, I'm going to do what he's doing, you know, so. Um, Were you the first one to take up an instrument? Yeah. So how did that happen? Well, uh, I was uh, in high school and I didn't, I was in ROTC and my best friend was Henry Hernandez, who was a guitar player. And I heard him, he was playing music somewhere, you know, and he should take me home uh, from High school, give me a ride home. And one day he tells me, I cannot ride you home today. I got to go to band practice. And I said, well, can I go with you? I walk into the garage. There's this band, this band playing, the Ambertones. And actually, it was, might, might have been another name. But anyway, I just fell in love with whatever they were doing. I said, uh oh, I got to go do something. And I picked up piano first thing. I learned three chords. And next thing I know, I'm jamming when I had a piano. I didn't have one. But whenever there was a piano somewhere there, I, I sit in. Then I adopted a uh, rhythm guitar. I learned the chords on rock and roll. Never learned how to read music all my life, but I had a lot of fun. I do have an ear for it. And so eventually I I got into the band. And then the, the owner, I mean, the leader of the band told me that the bass player is quitting. And do, you want, do I want to play bass? And I wasn't sure, but I took it. And he had a bass already for me and a bass amp. Next thing I know, I have the equipment. I fell in love with the bass. I've been playing bass for 59 years. Wow. <laughs> now, I noticed that uh, I read somewhere where at some point the band was called the Scepters. Was that before the Ambertones? Yeah, yeah. It was a very, very short time when I was in it. But I remember that name. Pretty and much. you guys were kind of essentially a surf band, right? Well, yeah, we did a lot of surf music compared to all the other East LA bands. Uh, we even wrote a song. I just thought of it the other day, um, and it was kind of funny because we recorded it in in Watts mm. <laughs> at a guy's house, and and the song was called Hang Ten. We're Mexicans recorded in the Watts, and <laughs> we're doing a surf, surf tune. Mexicans <laughs> recording a surf tune you, in you Watts. You could not make that up. Hang Ted came out on the uh, what was it called? Revolvo label. I would say so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like to mention that a lot of us did surf tunes back then. You know, a lot of people don't realize that even in East L.A. in around 62, 63, um, uh, the surf craze was huge with, with Dick, Ta Dick Dale, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, The Ventures, and oh, yeah. Wipeout was out and Pipeline. and every, I loved you know, all that music. Right? My band started as a surf band in the very beginning. And so a lot of others uh, in East L.A. Uh, so uh, I was going to mention the 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 original members of the Ambertones that I have here. I got a lot of this research from uh, you found that East Side Sound uh, website. Yeah. Uh, Gaia Versus site has a lot of history. And... Uh, Okay, so the original members, according to that, was uh, Ray Ariola on sax. Right, I remember him. Uh, you on bass. Uh, Henry Hernandez, guitar. Mike Sandoval, rhythm guitar. Danny Medina, keyboards. And Jimmy Alvarez, drums. Does that sound right? Correct. Okay, so at that point, who was uh, singing lead? Were you guys singing yourselves? Um. I'm pretty sure Danny Medina was. We were doing all any of the rock songs. He he had the rock voice for that. Uh, ballads. Uh, I don't remember us. I know I couldn't sing uh, ballads at the time. I ended up recording some music of mine, but that was later. I see. But to tell you the truth, uh, of all those band members, I can't think of 
any of us that did any ballads or any good quality singing. I remember that was got, tricky. Until we got Charlie Munoz in there. Right. So and according we, to this, um, the later members were uh, Frank Vasquez, sometimes known as Frankie Olvera on vocals, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Munoz vocals, uh, Tony Cardenas sax. Was it con Tony Cardenas or T Tony D uh, Duran? Tony Duran. Tony Duran. Yeah, it was Tony Boy, Duran. He was very talented. Oh, he was one of the, he was way ahead of his time, you know, and uh, really good soulful guy. He sounded like a guy out on, on TV, you know, not just a beginning teenager, you know. He was really talented. Tony Duran played great guitar and great sax. He also played with the Premiers uh, for yeah. a while, and then later with the Reuben and the Jets in the late '60s, early '70s. Yeah. Um, and then let's see somebody else here. Um, and Henry Sarnoff, piano, organ. Do you remember him? Yeah, yeah. He, and uh, Ruben Alvarez, drums. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So that's pretty much all the amber tones. Can you think of anybody else, or does that cover it? Uh, right off the top of my head, I can't. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah. We had uh, the the main core for a long the longest time. I was in the band. Was was uh, Henry Hernandez and me and um, uh, Danny and uh, Danny uh, Medina, or Blair Medina, and 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 well, till Jimmy, I think Jimmy passed away or not right away, but he, he couldn't drum with us right away. But anyway, we got we did go through a little mixture of that before, you know, near in the middle of our, you know, our, our band gigs. But anyway, mostly a pretty solid band. Very, very, I was just so happy to be in that band. They, we played all the right stuff, you know what I mean? The happy stuff. And I'd like to mention that uh, the Ambertones were one of the most uh, popular bands in East LA at the time and one of the best. And uh, I read somewhere where the name Ambertones came from. One of the guys happened to have an amber colored jacket. Is that where it came from? Yeah. That, and we all ended up buying, we found, you know, we went down to, uh, Oh, what's the name of that store downtown on Whittier? Curly's? Curly's. That's was it Curly's? Oh, oh God. God. That was, that's where all the East LA bands bought their outfits. Yeah. And they had really high style, you know, and we got these amber jackets, and they had this, uh, and just a little bit of a dark brown mixed in with it, and they were sharp looking. We dressed, And that's all those bands, mostly all the East LA bands, we dressed like the Beatles, you know, suits and ties and... Yeah, we, oh, yeah. we did. Uh, my first band, Mark and the Escorts, we had uh, some kind of gold colored Franchetti jackets with the collarless, like the Beatles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had those too. Yeah, yeah, I think we dressed like that too, a couple. Anyway, everybody was, we were dying to dress up. We just really liked, you know, doing something nice with our clothing. And uh, the girls loved it. I mean, we did it for the girls, and the girls, they were there. <laughs> Could not believe that we would play at, the thousands of people would be there for a sock hop or for uh, those rock and roll shows we did for Salesian. And they would wait for us backstage and we'd sign autographs. You know, and we're, we're like 16, 17 years old and we're doing that. And the girls would scream. Yeah, they'd scream. During that play. period. I think some, were, some of the girls were saying, that's enough already. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. But it was fun, man. I wouldn't trade those days for nothing. And you were uh, one of the few groups, along with my group, the Emeralds, the Blendells. Uh, some of us played Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. And um, there were a lot of other bands that did British Invasion, but they leaned more heavily to the Stones and the more R&B type uh, influence groups. But I remember uh, seeing you guys uh, do Beatles songs, which I love because they're still my favorite group to this day. Yeah, I still, you know, I have a band today. And me and my son, we do... Uh... Beatles songs, at least best, two. Best stuff, man. Yeah. Um, so let's. You mentioned the rock and roll shows. Let's touch on that. Um, um, according to the uh, albums that came out, they would record the bands live and put out an album of each show. And um, you were on at least two of them that I have here. On one of them, you guys did "Ooh Baby Baby" by Smokey Robinson, The Miracles, right? Do you remember that? Yeah. And on another show you did I Need Someone. That was Charlie Munoz, right? Right. It was a cover. I know, I know, I need someone. Yeah. No, Who did the original that? Do you remember? No. 
Yeah. But a lot, a lot of other bands from East LA did that yeah. song too, though. We went to Orleans, but we, we recorded it. And uh, and you also did My Prayer that day. Was that My Prayer? Yeah, we did that. We did. We And we also did what I call a lot of uh, complicated vocals. That, uh, Harmonies? You know, Shubat Shubat, you know, all those kind of big, uh, good soul groups. I did all those shubop shubops and we let's did talk about let's talk about the shubop shubop. Now my band stole that from you guys. Uh yeah. we learned I only have eyes for you. Uh oh, now you guys got it from the flamingos. Yeah. And then we heard you do we gotta learn that one. And that was great. The harmony. Shabbat shabbat. Yeah. I love we recorded it too. We put it on record. It didn't come out as good as the flamingos, but it was just it wasn't so bad. Good. It sounded good. Whoever recorded it, it came out pretty good, you know. And uh um, I, I remember being in the audience at one of the rock and roll shows when you guys played, and I have a very vivid memory of you guys playing an obscure Beatles song. Do you remember playing Little Child? Uh -oh. let, little child, little child, little child, won't you dance with me? I'm so oh, sad yeah. and lonely. Yeah, okay, now I, now I, yeah. I forgot the title, but I remember the melody line, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, man. Well, now I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> By the yeah. way, this is a I tough mean, interview, yeah. and we're talking about when I was 15, okay? Yeah, we're talking like, what, 60 years ago or something? But I remember you guys playing that song and being very impressed because it was not only a Beatles song, but it was an obscure Beatles song. Yeah. I remember seeing the Blendells, one of the best bands in East L.A., yeah, a were. national hit. They did, I remember seeing them do Hard Day's Night. They did I'll Cry Instead. Mm -hmm. Got every reason on earth to be mad because I just lost the only girl I had. Uh, so um, yeah, these memories uh, just are still there in my uh, brain somewhere. Yeah, I, um, little things like that. I'm very bad with song titles, but I do. Once you start reminding me, boy, everything comes right to life. You know. Do you have any memories uh, of those rock and roll shows aside from the Screaming Girls and? Uh, well, I remember. Uh, you, you remember the, the the one thing was kind of a highlight was uh, the rising stage in the front. Yes. They, they used to come up, you know. And to be on that bottom stage and coming up on that was like, real slow. I mean, it was like a highlight, you know. Very dramatic. Like, hey, yeah, the amber tones, and you come up from below the ground, and it comes up to the stage, and you and you look around and see all these. That's really coolest thing, man. I um, uh, just uh, there's little things like that, and like I said, just Charlie would uh, go out and sing to the audience and kneel down, and and these girls would go nuts, you know, and. and uh, and like I said, at the age of that, at that age, we thought every band was like that. And we thought everybody did that, you know, and and it didn't happen again after those days. It just stopped, the girls stopped screaming and they just yeah. started dancing. <laughs> yeah, it was a little period around 64, 65, when the, even well, the in Beatles East were, L.A. Yeah, the Beatles course. were responsible for that. Oh, yeah. That era of uh, mania inter entertainment, you know, and, 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 the, and the crowds just doing what they did. They they did a good job of just turning the whole world on to fun. You yes, know? that's right. Yeah. Uh, so in the early days, um, what was your relationship with the exotics, and uh, yeah. uh, how did that all start with the exotics? You well, remember? you know, we, my the, my brothers, my younger brothers, they're a year apart. One that Danny was a year younger than me, and Bobby was a year younger than me, and they saw me playing in the Ambertones and. And they started picking up instruments and, and we go in the garage and mostly them together. And they learned from some other people and they ended up playing. And I, I hardly knew anything about it because I was always busy with the Ambertones. Next thing you know, they come up with this really cool little crazy band, the Exotics. <laughs> and they were way, they were like the who coming out of somewhere, you know. You know, you know how the Beatles were kind of cool and they, they, they were a little wild. Wild is what they were, and they were jumping around and yeah. And I just said, wow, that's pretty entertaining. And you, you got to admit, they, they stirred up a crowd pretty good. Oh, absolutely. Good drummer. And, they have, um, and my brother Danny, he was very animated on stage. That's right. You know, so. Well, they were my age. And so we became rivals. We were in Battle of the Bands yeah. together. We both went to Garfield. And so we were definitely uh, rivals. And, and we made each other better, like I was telling Bobby last week when yeah. I interviewed Bobby and your brother. Yeah, I saw the interview, by the way. Thank you for doing that for them. Oh, pretty cool. It was a fun interview, man. It was fun talking to Bobby about the exotics, particularly, yeah, right. and then uh, Joey about the later Delgado's band that Bobby's also in. Yeah, it was a great band. 
But and then while well, you guys, while well, the Ambertones and the Exotics were practicing, uh, Joey and Stevie were these little five, six year olds going, "Hey, I kind of like this." And <laughs> yeah, they were, they were. Joey was picking up guitars already, and so was Jimmy. And uh, not not uh, my little brother, the youngest one, Stevie, was not doing any instruments, and he wasn't drumming or nothing, just singing. And then so we, uh, I don't know if I can move ahead to the after the the, the Ambertones broke up. I, I went, well, I got to tell you, first of all, the reason why the Ambertones broke up yeah. at, the, at the Vietnam draft, you know, the draft. Yeah. It drafted me and it drafted Danny Medina. And uh, I'm not sure about anybody else that they got later, but we, next thing you know, the, we're not in the band anymore. We're in a training for Vietnam, you know. And uh, so when I got back, oh, by the way, can I tell you, I played music in Vietnam. Some guy, uh, we, I, I was, Operating room nurse. I worked in surgery, believe it or not, and uh, and we had twelve hour shifts of working all day. And then at night, some one of the doctors, or like I call him, he's the surgeon general, or whatever he was. He took band equipment to Vietnam, and then he had, he had just a trio. He had a drums, bass player, and, and, a little, and microphones and stuff like that. And we started this little band called Mickey Taco and Quack. Were you Taco? I was taco. <laughs> Just a <laughs> wild guess. <laughs> and we played every night. We gotta get out of this place. It was, and the guys would sing with their lighters, and uh, just it was so heartwarming to play for them. Were you and just they, playing on the on the bass wherever you were? Yes, uh, it was kind of like little bungalows. Uh, they had an officers' club uh, for made out of bungalow, but nothing fancy. Same thing with the, um, uh, the enlisted men's club. And we played one night there, one night there. And uh, it was a, one of the best things I've ever done music-wise because it hit everybody's soul, including ours. To watch the guys look in your faces and when we, and, we're, and, they're doing, and they got the lighters out and they're singing, we got to get out of this place. Or, and they're into it, man. They're crying. And, and, it, it, and they requested that song 10 times a night. And they tipped us in quarters because that's all they had. Yeah. <laughs> so we we made about four dollars a night. <laughs> but it was wow. it was we didn't do it with the money, obviously. Right. Something we had an opportunity to do and wouldn't trade it for nothing. And then when I got out of the army, I started up with another band, but then I, uh, uh, that goes into Casey Kasem era. Right, right. We're gonna get to that in a little while because we still yeah. gotta cover the Ambertones here. Okay, that's cool. Um, all right. I was going to say that, you know, the draft in the Vietnam War is one of the main things that broke up the whole East L.A. scene. You know, so many guys from the Blundells, the Premiers, yeah. found themselves in Vietnam. And right. that was uh, ended the, the era, really. Let's get back to the uh, the recordings of, of the Ambertones. Your first record was Hang Ten uh, by the Scepters. Same guys, pretty much. But, um, but your second record was on GMP Crescendo Records which is a label my band was on, Mark and the Escorts. We did our two singles, Get Your Baby and Dance With Me on GMP Crescendo, the same year in 65. Uh -huh. I didn't know you guys were on the same label. And you recorded, Woo Shaolina. Oh, yeah. Cool <laughs> no, Los Lobos recorded that a few years ago, too. Yeah. Uh, Charlena. And uh, the flip side was uh, Bandito. Do you remember that song? Yep, I sure do. Yep, man, I haven't heard that that title in a long time but thanks for reminding me I, the other one i knew real good charlena i was just we guess the people would sing along with us on that it's very easy words you know yeah uh then your third record was on the dotty label yeah. which was owned by your manager uh, leonard mamola yeah can i tell you a funny story about yeah, him yes <laughs> he was a used car salesman he was our manager <laughs> <laughs> tell you what i'm gonna do Oh boy, we could not. When we realized it, man, he's a used car salesman. But the best thing ever happened to me because I told him I needed a car. He gave me a beautiful 1958 uh, Buick, uh, nice size car. I forget the name of the model, and it was all fixed up and real cheap. Got dirt cheap, and I could pay it pay it off whenever I wanted to. You know, nice. and that that was a good thing about him. And he was a good guy. He didn't. Didn't act like a used car salesman. Didn't hustle you guys too much, huh? And I couldn't remember if he did. <laughs> but, yeah. So apparently, 
One of the songs was called Chocolate Covered Ants. What the hell was oh, that? Yeah. I wasn't too happy about that one. <laughs> was it an instrumental or was it a... Uh, I think so, yeah. It was not... I don't, I can't remember loving that song. But, <laughs> you know... And the flip side, it. the flip side was One Summer Night. That yeah, that was a... By the way, that's another one of those showcase for Charlie Munoz to sing beautiful voice that he had, you know. Yeah, excellent singer and a very good performer to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, currently singing with the Cannibal, the Headhunters Band. That's right. Uh, which I played for with for a short time in around 2010 or so. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the fourth record was also on Dottie Records, and it was I Need Someone with Charlie Munoz, right? And yeah. the flip side was something you wrote called If I Do. Yeah, I wrote that. that. I love that song. I wish I could have sang it, but uh, it was uh, Charlie Munoz sang it, you know. And it needed a little rougher voice like mine, but he did a good job. Don't get me wrong. It's just that I, I actually wrote a song that was on the record, and it's on a forty-five. And my name's on it. That I can I'll never get over that. <laughs> you know, I'm serious. I mean, I just what inspired have, you I, to write the song? I have a well, I'm just bad relationships. I, I don't know where <laughs> to find a girlfriend. It basically, it talks about if if I did something wrong, would you please forgive me? If you did something wrong, I'll forgive you. That, that's basically yeah, the, the yeah. gist of the song. And then, um, but uh, eventually, uh, yeah, that song there, uh, I, I still have a, a copy of it at home. Oh, cool. In, in the sleeve and everything. And uh, I showed it to my granddaughters uh, a couple years ago. And, and I said, do, do you, hey, girls, do you know what this is? And they looked at it, had no idea. Because it's some kind of disc. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That reminds me of my daughter. Uh, uh, my daughter, when uh, she first saw my 45s, yeah, he goes. What kind of CDs are these? <laughs> yeah, these oh, big God. CDs. Oh God! Uh, so Crescendo Records, you guys uh, recorded with them in '64. Dottie Records was '65. You did the two singles, um, and then your fifth record was um, on the. Uh, it was called Ray Jack Records. Yeah, and uh, two Leonard Mamola tunes. Cruise and clap your hands. Yeah, we were trying to emulate uh, let's Whittier take a trip down Whittier Boulevard, kind of those kind of real hang loose, kind of yelling and screaming songs, get the whole neighborhood rowdy up. You know, was it an instrumental? Uh, well, they, we were talking through them and singing through them, just making people yell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that was in '65, and uh, it was re-released in '66 on uh, Newman Records. I don't yep. know if you remember, remember that. that. Okay, now we're in uh, 1966, uh, and also on Ray Jack Records, I Only Have Eyes For You, and I Can Only Give You Everything. Yeah, that's the only song I sang lead on. Really? I, only get, I, I sang lead on that one, because I needed a rough voice, <laughs> something that, you know, I, as a, who, I'm trying, it was a cover song from one of those old rock bands, uh, I wish I'd have remembered that, but I, I might think of it later. But it was it was a, like a B cut. Anyway, it came out pretty good, and I've seen it posted on uh, some kind of a. Yeah, you know they have these uh, radio shows that show weird music or good rowdy music, and it, that got it, somehow it came up, and they play it, you know, on this station. These state, you know, play that weird music, off the wall music, is what I'm trying to say. Sometimes they call it garage rock, you know. Garage rock, right? Yeah, art, much, early stuff is sort of played like that too. Yeah. Uh, so was it more of a rocker song than a ballad, right? Oh yeah, definitely not a rocker. I could not do ballads. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then your seventh record in 1967 was on the White Whale label, which was oh, an yeah. independent label, but it was major. I mean, the Turtles were on White Whale for a while. That's right. Yeah, we were so proud of that, by the way. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, you did a cover of uh, Wilson Pickett's 99 and a half. Yeah. Just won't do. Yeah. And uh, and the song called You Don't Know. You Don't Know Like I Know. Like I Know. That's the one that got airplay. I don't know if you know that. Did you know that? No. It got airplay. And uh, we made it on the top 40 on KRLA. Uh, and uh, I, that's a story I, I almost forgot about to tell. But it's a true story. We were... I'll, I'll never forget uh, driving up to uh, band practice, 
and it came on the radio. And I go, what? That's us playing on the radio. So I drove as fast as I could and pulled into the guy's parking lot, drummer's parking lot, slung open the doors and turned it full blast. So I honked the horn and they all came out here and I could not believe we were hearing ourselves. Uh, yes. It was really fun, man. Wow. Yeah. And then it got, and then, then the next week it got a number 38 on the top 40. And uh, next week was 36. Next week was 34. Next week, poof, gone. <laughs> So exciting, huh? same, you know, I wish I had a, uh, I wish I had a copy of those lists because they're on the same top 40 list. You got the Rolling Stones, Beatles, the Supremes, all those bands, and, and we were on there, you know, Amber Tones. But it didn't we didn't go far, you know. But I'm still proud of it, you know. I think these later generations don't understand what that meant because the radio was kind of a magical device, you know, oh, yeah. like not, to be in your car not, and hear your song on the radio. Yeah. You can get anything on Spotify right now or any of the yeah. other venues, but you couldn't get on the radio unless you were a big yeah, hit. Pretty tough. Yeah. So then, uh, oh, by the way, that song, uh, You Don't Know Like I Know, apparently was a Sam and Dave recording. Sam and yeah. Dave song. Yeah. So Probably. it must have been like an R&B tune. Hmm? Yeah. Doom, 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 doom. It had kind of a really cool groove to it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, that's, that's about as close as we got to being a you know, number one. Anyway, we got in the top 40. Well, it says here that uh, at some point, Casey Kasem came in. Let's try to oh, work that, with you guys. Yeah, that's after the the Ambertones. Uh, uh, that's after we got drafted and came back. We started well, another That's band. when that was? So yeah. so when you got me, it was when you came back from the Army that Casey Kasem managed you. And what was the name of the group? Uh, it was Eddie Haddad and Can Canyon. Uh Eddie had they they pronounced it Eddie Haddad, but his name he's from Lebanon, Lebanon, and it was Eddie Haddad, and it was he was a uh, Lebanese, and the fact that Casey Kasem was Lebanese and Casey Kasem is his real name, and uh, he, he adopted him as a uh, he was a really good singer. He was kind of a Vegasy kind of guy, and uh, more entertaining on on stage, and he, uh, and he did really good. Not the best singer in the world, and matter of fact. His his voice was too far ahead of his time. In other words, he was too animated, and so we didn't make any hits. Even though Casey Kasem was right there to help us do everything. But and at the time, Casey Kasem was a very popular DJ on Carol. Yeah, most popular. I, when I mention his name to anybody, no matter where I go in the world, everybody, what? He, he, he yeah. was, I have pictures with him. He was the nicest guy. He was not like a, an agent. He. He took care of us, uh, made sure we were financially comfortable. Uh, he made sure of everything. He was the nicest guy in the music business that I ever had, had the chance to hang out with. And, uh, oh, God. And, uh, and eventually, uh, after two years, I started hooking up with my brothers. And then it okay, right. lured me away. Okay, but before we get off of Casey, at the time, he was extremely popular locally because he was on KRLA. He even had a dance show called Shebang. Yeah. That I actually went on and danced on, believe it or not. I'm not a dancer, but I, I went on there when I was about 15 or 16. Yeah. Uh, but then later he became a national name because he had that uh, Casey Kasem's Casey Kasem's oh. Countdown. It was a national radio show. Exactly right. And so he became nationally known after that. Everybody, he used to book the Midnighters a lot too. Yeah. Yeah, he was uh, way ahead of his time and his voice was so comfortable. Oh, he great had voice. a unique style of this is a song written by a band that went through a lot of problems and they had to go do this and took a little, it didn't take long, but he set, set the music up so perfectly. This, these band turns out to be human beings, according to him. And so then they had stories to tell and just, and what a gentleman, you know, and I, I, uh, I hated to leave him, but my brothers started getting okay. antsy. <laughs> Where did he uh, book you, Casey Kasem, oh, during in that Vegas. time? He got, he got us into Vegas. Tahoe and Reno, and he also signed us up, signed us up with uh, Mercury Records, uh, and uh, we thought we were we thought we were rock stars. Right after we signed that contract, we went down to Hollywood and we we're looking at Cadillacs and limousines, <laughs> and we thought we were going to buy one. You know, and uh, did you record for Mercury? Yeah, we had a couple what songs. Uh, I'm trying to remember, they were originals, singles, a single. Uh, yeah. Oh God! You know, I, I thought we were just going to talk about the Amber I would have looked that up, but I do have some copies of that too. 
Mm-hmm. He uh, he got us in, and he he sent us to radio stations with the copy of the record. And don't tell anybody. Go watch the Gibbs and the DJ <laughs> to make <laughs> sure it got played. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And uh, so he uh, yeah he he helped us out so much. We, we dressed nice, you know, and he he just um, and it was not a, it was not pressurized. He was just. He let us do what we wanted to do, and uh, and he he was worth hanging out with. I mean, signing the contract with him was one of the best things I've ever done. I just just wish my other thing. Well, things come along; things happen for a reason. You That's know, right. Thing. I noticed here before we get off the amber tones, you made one more single. Your eighth single on White Whale was called "A Million Tears." Yeah. And the flip side was "A Little Bit of Loving." Oh yeah, yeah. That's uh. Those were those were not as important as the other one, the one right before that, as far as making a big noise, yeah. you know. But they were good. They were good songs. But everything we recorded was pretty good. Um, but you know, we, we tried. Yeah. There was a lot of good stuff coming out of East LA. Oh yeah, and I loved all the bands. I you know, it was I can't think of a band I didn't like hanging out with. Some of those guys were really talented, especially the big bands with horns. I we could never we never tried that, but. But there were some good bands with all of the horn sections and blue yeah. satins. Yeah, oh, I love them. Yeah. Um, now this, I read somewhere where that million tears. Uh, Frank Vasquez sang that, which the guy that also went by Frank Olvera. Yeah. What was the story with him? Was he in the band in and out, or what's the deal? Yeah, I would say like he's at the beginning and near the end. He, he took off and went away somewhere. I forget where. I didn't really keep track of him. Uh, yeah, we were not close, except at the beginning we were, but. Uh, but he just, like I said, we didn't, we did our thing. That's all I know. He didn't get in the way. We didn't miss him that much, but he did what he had to do, whatever he was doing. I never asked questions, you know, mm-hmm. but he was, he was a good guy. Well, here's the next segment of this show that I like to do. Um, since I was part of this scene with my first band, Mark and the Escorts, and then we changed our name to the Men from Sound. Yeah. Members would kind of come and go, but those are my two uh, bands of the early to mid '60s, and um, I like to gather up the flyers on which my bands played with my guests' bands. You know, so yeah. I I found twelve flyers where my bands, Mark and the Escorts, and the Men from Sound, were on the bill with the Ambertones. So this will trigger some memories and and give a lot of bands a shout out. Um, they were playing also, and I deserve a shout out. So the first gig that I have here that we played together, and I know you'll remember this. You remember that show behind Johnson's Market in the parking lot on a flatbed was, truck? If you hadn't bring that up, I would have brought it up because I remember that. And I'm bring, I'm glad you brought it up. Go ahead. Okay, here's the lineup. It happened in the parking lot of Johnson's Market on Whittier Boulevard. We'll be here in person. The Midnighters, the Night Themes, Ronnie and the Casuals, the Four Queens, the Sisters, Little Ray, yeah. the Ambertones, Little Egypt, Mark and the Escorts, the Blue Angels, the Counts, and the Vandells. Wow. Now that's look all those bands in I, one I'm day. I'm pretty sure that's every band in East LA at the time. Seems like uh, it. I don't know if you can see this, but this was uh, oh, okay. in the newspaper. There's a clipping. Um, Do you so remember our sta- Do you remember our stage? The flatbed truck, right? Flatbed truck, like that weird. Right. I built that stage on top of this big truck, and they could see the wheels and everything. And but there was, this... and the girls were screaming. Was... Girls yeah. were screaming. Yeah, it's back, it was back in the days, right behind a big market in the parking stuff. Right, parking lot. That was probably the biggest parking lot in East LA too. Yeah, probably. That was the most popular mar- market. Yeah. I remember the Oscar Meyer Wiener Mobile would be back there sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that too. Everybody yeah. would show up. Okay, so the next gig, this is um, October 9th, 1965, I believe. It could be four. Um, top billing, Ambertones, with their latest recording, I Need Someone, and If I Do, Little Ray and the Progressions, one of the best bands going. Little mm-hmm. Ray, one of the best singer performers. Oh, yeah. He was a great showman, great singer, everything. Yeah. Great band. The fabulous Jades. Remember the Jades? Uh, they were from uh, yeah. San Pedro yeah. and 
Yeah, uh, they were not. A, they were not local to East LA. No, but they were part of the scene. They played a lot. I've of heard that. I've heard the name Jades, but I can't yeah. remember. And Mark and the Escorts, my band, Montebello Armory. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Donation two dollars. I don't know if you can see this, but we we're big time, weren't we? <laughs> oh yeah. There you go. Two dollars, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of money. Okay. Next, Montebello Ballroom. I love that place. Okay. Um, Friday the 15th of October. Um, could be 65. Uh, I, I had them written down here, but no, it doesn't matter. The Blue Satins, Amber Tones, Mark and the Escorts, Royal Gems. Dress Dressy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they used to put down for the girls, no capris. That's right. Tell me what you remember about the Montebello Ballroom. Well, you know, the details of the, the, the event, were, I mean, the, the venue was not, I can't, but it was always fun. Every time we played there, it seemed like that was one of our favorite what? gigs. The crowd, I guess, was located just right, you know. As we, you know but remember you, there was a, there was an upper stage and a lower stage? Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, that's another thing, yeah. Did you ever play on the top? I don't remember doing that, but I... We did a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, don't forget, I got we got one. <laughs> we're going back uh, almost sixty years. And then, we, and to get into the place, you had to go up a bunch of stairs. We had to carry our amps up about oh, forty stairs. Oh, I didn't like that part, <laughs> especially the 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 B three player, the organ players. Oh, they're, they're the ones that, oh man, that was a rough one. Yeah, that's where our backs are screwed up today. Barely getting up the stairs, you know, with that. It, you had to be young and strong to do that. Yep. Here's another one. Godfrey Dance Night, the big union hall on 49th Street, City of Vernon, uh, December 11th, I believe, 1965. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's a cool bill. Check this out. Don Julian, remember Don Julian and the Meadowlarks? Uh, Bobby Day, Rockin' Robin, and over and over, over and over and over again. Uh, Don and Dewey, who were the original band that did Farmer John. Um, Sunny Night, Confidential, dedicated to you. The Larks, the jerk. Leon Peels and the Blue Jays. Johnny Flamingo, you're mine. Plus three great bands, Amber Tones, Impalas, and Mark and the Escorts. So there, there we were. <laughs> hey, do you, you don't by chance have any um, posters from the, the days. I remember in the, in the late, uh, never, never when we almost finished with the Amber Tones, they played at the big Union Hall and opened up for uh, I Can Tina Turner review. Oh, wow. That was, oh, you talk about a highlight. I've never seen a band better than that up to that point. And uh, that guy, Ike Turner, even though he turned out to be a jerk, was one of the best showmen you ever want to see. The way he set up the stage for Tina, he did something really, I hope I can, he did this really strange thing. During the day, he would set up a big, you know the street lamps that light up the sky, a lamp, or we call them a telephone. Anyway, you get a big um, factory fan in front of it and cut a pie slice of a cardboard and installed it in the fan. So when the fan went around and the light came through, it came like a disco light. Oh. He was way ahead of the time. And so he set it up during the day. And at night when certain songs came on, he turned it on back there and the, the fan would go out. And the light would hit her, and she'd be in slow motion. Oh like that. wow! It was like a weird. strobe light, kind of like a strobe, strobe light. It was. She did, he did that with the mechanics, without wow. the mechanics. Ah, well, we were so impressed. And uh, in fact, Bobby mentioned that, that. Bobby, your brother mentioned that in the last interview that yeah. uh, he was blown away too. We opened up three shows for them, and they're all big halls in East LA. Right before they became big stars, you know, they weren't. They were playing bigger venues, of course, right after that. But uh, they were just starting, and, and boy, I've never seen a band more talented than that. The Beatles were a different type of talent. Yeah. I'm talking about these guys. Performing. The show. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. And our energy. Um, so those are the Amber Tones you played with them three yeah. times. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if Bobby was playing on that gig or if he just was in the audience, but he mentioned the same thing, that it blew his mind. Okay, now here's a biggie. Yeah, he this, was, by the way. They were, they were playing with us. He was playing with you? They were one of the opening bands for at least one. Oh, of the, the exotics show. played. Yeah. Oh, cool. I remember now. Um, here's another biggie. Big Union Hall, 
April 9th, 1966, Dobie Gray. I'm in with the oh. in crowd. Oh, yeah, I like him. And by this time, I've been, we had changed our name to the Men from Sound. And we got to back up Dobie Gray that night. Oh. And we were blown away because we were about 15, 16 years old. And Dobie Gray, a hit artist, adult, came to our rehearsal. He came to our freaking house and rehearsed during the day with us and was really nice. And we backed him up on In Crowd. And I remember he did Hitchhike by Marvin Gaye. Yeah. So that was a highlight. So here it is. Mr. In Crowd himself, Dobie Gray, doing the In Crowd, the Midnighters and Little Willie G, the Ambertones, Men From Sound, Exotics, Runabouts, oh. Essence, and Impalas. So the Exotics were there too, all three of us. Um, Men From Sound, Exotics, and Ambertones there. But look at all the bands there. You got one, two, yeah. three, four, five, six, seven bands in one night. Yeah, that always amazed me how they can do that. And we just, it just came to mind right now, the Delgado brothers were playing in different bands together in those days. <laughs> I just, my, I, by the way, I love my new, my brother's album. I mean, my brother's band now, the Delgado oh. brothers, they're the, one of the best bands ever came out of East LA. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So proud of them. Here's the Dobie Gray one. And um, they misspelled Dobie. They put Dobby with two B. Yeah. There's a lot of misspellings in there. I remember that poster. Yeah. I okay, here's another one. This one is um, another big union hall, April 16th, 1966. Uh, spectacular dance and show, The Midnighters and Lil Willie G, Lil Ray, The Progressions, The Ambertones, The Sisters, The Rayettes, The Epics, The Men from Sound, The Prophets, and The Impalas. A huge, you know, Lineup. Be with. Be with. Some damn good groups. Um, <laughs> That's nice. Big Union, Sporty Dress, Donation, $2, No Capris. You're right. It says No Capris here. Yeah. Yeah, there's something yeah. about Capris. Here's and, another one. Remember yeah. Heidi Ho? Uh, Kennedy oh. Hall. Huh? Kennedy Hall. Oh, Kennedy Hall. I love that place, too. That's yeah. another one. Heidi Ho was the uh, promoter. Oh, um, yeah. I remember now. Company. I think that was Sam Nevada, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so it says here, The Midnighters featuring the great Willie G, plus the VIPs, who later became El Chicano, yeah. the Ambertones, the Men from Sound, the Unusuals, April 29th, 1966, Big Kennedy Hall. When we moved our gear from one gig to another, I remember you, you held your um, guitar over your shoulder, that, that brain on your amp, on the left, this left hand and your speaker on the right. And that's all you needed to get set up, you know. Yeah. It was like that quick. And then when you get off stage, do the same thing. You go off. Let the other band come up. Almost did le less than 20 minutes between bands. Oh, yeah. We'd set up and get out fast. Yeah. There was a lot of, nowadays, man, <laughs> try to get up a, any kind of concert takes a half a day. Well, yeah. Well, because of all that lugging, I got arthritis in my lower back today. Oh, God. Don't get me started with that. <laughs> Uh, my knees aren't so good either. Anyway, here's another one. This is pre-graduation dance and show featuring the Midnighters at the Kennedy Hall doing their two latest releases, Love Special Delivery, and It'll Never Be Over For Me, featuring the great Willie G. The Ambertones, the Men From Sound, the Runabouts, and the Sisters. Remember the Sisters? G, yeah. Baby G, Ursi Arvisu. Yeah. Sister. Uh -huh. Your sisters. I rarely saw them play because uh, we were always you know, packing, ready to go or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that so was I, another thing. I never really sat there, you know, and watched them because I was so busy getting in, in or out of gig, gigs, you know. So, yeah, it's... But, and a lot of times the bands didn't meet each other for that same reason. Exactly. Well, I know I didn't keep touch with you guys that much either because of that constant moving, moving. Yeah. You, you, between you and my brothers, you guys kept... Uh, close contact because yes, we, right we knew each other. other probably the same age and everything too. we right? went to the same high school yeah oh that's another good thing about the ambertones it was kind of unusual that three guys from garfield and three guys from roosevelt which made it a, a little bit yeah. awkward sometimes the rival school yeah, did you go which school did you go to huh i went to garfield i graduated in 1964 <laughs> oh wow no wonder i missed you i graduated in 67 <laughs> 67 yeah, well, you know, I graduated at 16 years old because I skipped the fourth grade. 
Oh. I used to be smart. And then all oh, of a wow. sudden, I became a musician. And I'm I'm and cool now. Dumbed you down, huh? <laughs> <laughs> dumbed us all uh, down. I don't know what else I'd do. Really. Cool, man. Okay, here's another one. This is a cool one. We're talking uh, uh, May 14th, 1966. Uh, do you remember the Huntington Park Ballroom? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, we played there a couple of times. Okay, here's the, the lineup. Lil Ray and Review. At that time, he had a whole review. He had the Rayettes, the All Epics, right. the Four Clefts, and the Progressions. The Ambertones, the Exotics, the Men from Sound. There we are, three groups again. The Righteous Rhythms with Tina and Marty, the Go-Go Girls. May 14th, 1966, Huntington Park Ballroom. It's a cool, cool flyer. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, that. I, I I have that poster or something, I, I, a picture of it anyway. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then here's one. December 9th, 1966, the Kennedy Hall, big dance and show featuring six top bands, the VIPs featuring Clarence Playa. Clarence yeah, Playa had previously been in the progressions. Now he's in the VIPs, who later became El Chicano. Bobby Espinoza, you know. Fred Sanchez on bass, leader. Um, yeah, it was a great band. The Apollos, the Teen Turbans, the Men from Sound, the Emeralds, and the Ambertones. Now, the Emeralds were another great band. Everybody liked them because they always sounded like the record. They were really Yeah, good. they were good, too. Yeah, I remember them. Yeah. And here's the last one of the 12 gigs we played together on the same bill. Heidi Ho. Uh, big Kennedy Hall, featuring the Ambertones, doing their big big hit record. And it doesn't say what it is. It just says doing their big hit record. Okay. Uh, the Royal Checkmates, the Men from Sound, the Emeralds, and the Exotics again. There we were. Yeah. They, so they got, a, they got pretty active there near the end of my, our, my oh, yeah. turn with the Ambertones. Yeah. So there you go. We did at least 12 gigs together on the bill. And there may be more, but those are the ones I have. Who was who was uh, your your band? Who was the biggest uh, celebrity you played with? Uh, opened up for back then? Yeah, in the sixty. Well, like I said, we backed up Doby Gray. Yeah, uh, we were on the bill, I believe, with Roy Head. Remember Treater Treater Wright? Uh -huh. um, I did. Uh, I did Sunny and Cher one time at the East LA College, and uh, they only filled up one third of the stadium. But um, but that was a I, that day I I have a long I had a long going relationship started that day with uh, Sonny because uh, we met setting up our equipment and we just talked and talked. Mm -hmm. he's a really nice guy and then we uh, next thing you know we're in studios in Hollywood and they came in the same studio hey I remember you from the, the concert you did and, and we got made friends again twenty years later you go I'm in Hawaii playing music. And I meet him again, and he he asked me to back up his his band. They were doing a concert for a celebrity tennis tournament, and he asked my band to back him up just because he remembered what, how good we were, and it turned out nice. great. Nice, he remembered you wow. And that guy was another nice guy. You talk about another case of case when it comes to heart and soul, and or you know I hated when he passed. You know, yeah. And same thing with anyway, but it's just a good guys and out there. Not not all good. Not all big stars are, are, are nice people, but we lucked out. I, met, I lucked out making a lot of nice people in the, along the way. So see what happens, you know. Yeah. I'm still going. I don't know. I'm still playing music. Can you believe that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Me too. Yeah, you got to do it. Yep. Um, so let's get back to, uh, so when you started playing with the Del Delgado Brothers, was that like in the late 70s or where was that? No, no, early 70s. Early 70s. Yeah, when I got back. From Vietnam, it was 1969. I started off with that that band I told you, Eddie had died in Canyon. I think it lasted not quite two years or about two years. And by the way, Danny Medina was in that band. But anyway, long story short, I, I stayed with him. Then, like I said, my brothers, I kept come home sometimes, and, and man, they're kicking up pretty good, you know. And I go, whoa. So, and they needed me to play bass. And my brother Bobby was playing bass, but he didn't want to, he only wanted to play blues and reggae and that's it he's really solid and i bought up all the top 40 stuff and but co complicated stuff too i'm talking about we did 
you know, the, the guitar harmonies uh, uh, from the uh, Doobie Brothers and uh, a couple other bands that were really difficult to copy, you know, and we did a good job. And we lasted uh, about eight years from early 70s, 7200 to 70 to 80, I mean, to 79 or 80 until we got a job in Hawaii. The best, the best, I was one of my favorite bands of all time was the Delgado Brothers and it was all brothers, not just three. It was five brothers in the band and we did really good. We played all over the place. And But when we got that job in Hawaii, we were there for two months. I came back to LA and I packed all my stuff. I said, guys, I'm going back to Hawaii. I think my soul was over there. My uh -huh. heart, yes. I mentioned when I interviewed, uh... Uh, Bobby and Joey uh, last week yeah. that um, that I saw you guys around 79. Yeah. You were playing at a club, I believe on Beverly Boulevard near Hollywood. And it was all of you. It was like you said, five of the Delgado brothers. Yeah. And uh, and I remember you guys playing Miss You by the Stones. Oh, I, yeah. I remember that. I still play that song. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it was great to see all you guys together. It was like five yeah. Delgado brothers in the same band. Yeah. When we broke up, it was the best thing that happened for either one of us. Even though I, I would like to be in my brother's band now, what I did was what I wanted to do. We traveled the world, live in Hawaii. I, I stayed there for 30 years. And then my, that's when Bobby started coming in. And then started they started doing original music, which he loved. Mm -hmm. And they started doing more blues and stuff. And next thing you know, they were, my brothers are untouchable right now. They're, they're not world famous, but uh, they are famous in the blues field. They play blues festivals all over the world now. And there's three brothers, my youngest brother, Stevie, and my brother, Joey, and my brother, Bobby. And uh, they are very, very talented. And every song they do has to do with, is originally done for either a family member, a friend, or mm -hmm. something important in our lives, you know. And it's amazing what they can do. I saw him perform twice uh, about a week ago, you know, yeah. and uh, no, they're, they're, they're great. And uh, I love their albums, especially that Learn to Fly album. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I like all of them, but that Learn to Fly is probably one of my favorites, you know. Anyway, what basically what happened was we all fell apart eventually. And I, I got into touring, playing music for the troops, Air Force bases and stuff like that. I put a little band together and we traveled all over the world and Japan, Philippines, Hong Kong, uh, Guam, and all the Air Force bases. And we did four tours out there, and we just loved it. The crowd, it, it brought back memories of me playing for the, in Vietnam for the troops. I know how to do it for them. I know what songs they want to hear. I know you got to hire a pretty girl on stage, uh, a Tina Turner of our band, and she used to flirt with the guys, and the guys would go, wow, I love you, whatever. And it was just a great show. We put on a show and a half, and the guys... With their lighters, singing along with all the words. And it was just, that was during the time you were living in Hawaii. You were going to all, yeah, all over the place. Yeah, I was leaving town, going in. I, I would only leave for two months at a time. I became an on-the-road musician for 30, 40 years almost, you know. And uh, and then, uh, next thing I know, my son moves out to, to Hawaii. And, oh, I, that even better story is that he, my son's growing up in Los Angeles all this time. And I mean, his his uh, his mom were separated and then I'm, we were separated, I mean. And uh, so we, he was learning the guitar and I didn't know how good he was because he was in LA and I was in Hawaii. But I needed a guitar player for one of my tours to Japan and none of my brothers could commit. And they said, why don't you try your son? He's getting pretty good. And I said, are you sure? He's only 20, 21. So I, uh, so I call him up and I say, yeah, I can go out there. And, and then he joined my band and my band members were not happy. They said, well, this is, uh, you're, you're hiring your son. That's, uh, what do you call that? Uh, nepotism. nepotism. Yeah. And then, but eventually he, they fell in love with him. He's such a cool guy. They taught him tricks he had to know within, within two months. And they, everybody, they all got together and they learned a lot of music together. And he became a, an accomplished guitarist because of them. And we did more tours. The next thing you know, he moved out there to Hawaii. And that was, I've had him in my band off and on for 30 something years now. And so. Is he the one that just, is he the one that just sat in with the Delgado brothers in Pasadena? Yeah. 
He was great, man, playing with the Joey there. <laughs> my son, my my son is 34, uh, 54. And he's probably not gonna like me saying that. Uh and my and his son is 30, 32 years old. That's how old I am. My wow. grandson is 32. And uh and then my have granddaughters are 16 and 12. And they're both musicians, by the way, my granddaughters play piano and sing and very good. How did you hook up with those military tours? Did it have anything to do with your military background or how that happened? Um, I, no, I just, I, I'm pretty sure I, I found a guy, somebody was looking for a band to play at Hickam Air Force Base in uh, Hawaii. And I went down with my band and I did, I told you what I did. I, I know what they want to hear. And the manager of the, the base, he says, hey, we need a band like you to cover all the other bases on in the, the Pacific. And so, he hired us to do all these tours. We started northern Japan, go down to Tokyo, then go down to, um, to uh, Kadena, which is uh, the other part of the southern part of Japan. Then we go to the Philippines, do three bases out there. Boy, you talk about seeing the world in two months, you know. And everything's paid for, everything's, and then the crowd just, they just loved us, you know. What was just, the name of the band? Uh, I'm pretty sure we just called ourselves Delgado, something like that. Uh, I named I I try to name my band something to do with Delgado, but right now, right now, me and my son call ourselves Eddie and David Delgado. That's we tried different names in uh, Tennessee, where you know where I live now. I live in Nashville. We tried names like uh, El Vato Locos or Los Vatos Locos, <laughs> or we did uh, something like uh, the Habanero Brothers, a hot band. And the people out here can't pronounce it out here, you know? right. <laughs> but we just stick with common names. But, hey, before we get uh, away from Hawaii, I want to tell a story, and I'm not going to retell this story because I told it on the uh, interview with your brothers uh, last week. But I went to Hawaii with my then girlfriend in, uh, I think it was 84, and I happened to run into Danny, and, oh. I, and, I, and I saw them perform in Kauai and hung out with them. And he told me that you were playing at the Hilton on Oahu. So you probably don't remember this, but um, when I got back to Oahu, I went to the Hilton and I saw you, you were in break. And I walked up behind you and I tapped on your shoulder. And I said, by any chance, do you know a song called Huggies Bunnies? And you freaked out and you turned around what the hell? <laughs> Huggies Bunnies, yeah. It. It, now you guys recorded that. Was that a B-side or something or what? Yeah, it had to be. It was not our biggest song ever but i don't know that was you know a song what? by the romancers yeah can i tell you that our, our guitar player uh, even though i tell you i tell you a lot about our, our good singer our, our charlie muñoz how great a singer he was our guitar player was way ahead of his time uh, henry hernandez mm -hmm. he could play a really good uh, dick dale and the del tones kind of stuff and any english Beatles songs he had that he had all those riffs down really good and he made our band really. He's the one that had the music together, and Charlie had the, the vocals together, and and the rest of us were just having so much fun, keeping up. You know, we never played really. Well, we took some hard songs, but mostly it was just party party time. I'm always proud of that. But Henry Hernandez, I'll, I'll always brag about him. He he doesn't like to be bragging about it, but he he's good, man. He's the one that got me started. I owe him all everything when it comes to being in the Ambertones. Thanks for not taking me home. So just take me to the garage and watch them. It was the coolest thing ever happened to me. Cool, man. So then you wound up moving from Hawaii to Nashville because your son got a job there or something. What happened there? Oh, no, no. He, uh, no, he left uh, because he got married. Oh. And uh, they can't, it's hard to find a house affordable to start a family with. So his day job brought him out here to work in audiovisual technician. He started working in Opryland. And then uh, he stayed here for four or five years. Now, all of a sudden, he started having children. And I came to visit my granddaughter four times every spring, fall, spring, fall. And when she was two years old, took me to the airport, started crying like crazy. And I, cry I started crying, went back to Hawaii as a man. My family's over there. So I, I moved out here. It's been 13 years now, and uh, and there's a lot of things. I, my family is more important than any Hawaiian place. 
but at the same time, I miss Hawaii every day. It's in my soul. My I call it my soul's over here in Hawaii, but my heart is here in Nashville, you know. So, and my brothers, by the way, wrote a song about that on their latest album, uh, Two Trains. They wrote a song called um, uh, uh, Ohana, Tennessee. Ohana in Hawaiian means family. If, if you have Ohana, that means either your blood related or just close friends, people that are, you know that you're Ohana. So the song talks about me missing my Hawaiian beaches and my beautiful lands out there, my friends, but I'm here with my Ohana in Tennessee. That's what the song means. And when we heard it over here, we started crying. It's so beautiful. If you ever get a chance to listen to it, listen yeah. to the words and and the, and the vocals are in there are so good. And it just, just, that's what I do. And that's what my brothers do. You know. And you're gigging there in Nashville occasionally? I, uh, at least twice a week. Me and my son have pretty good, you know, we have a, we play small clubs. Sometimes we get a big club, you know, but yeah, it's pretty much just friends of ours get together and dance and have fun and keeps me alive. Yeah, hey. Oh, yeah. So overall, I think we covered pretty much everything. Uh, why don't you let me know just uh, how do you feel about um, the old uh, days in the 60s in East L.A. and the whole East Side Sound scene? Uh, what do you have to say about it in general? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, if it hadn't happened, I probably would have had a really good job. I was I got offered a job at 18 to be a postal inspector, which is equivalent to FBI. And I turned it down because I had gigs to come out. Hey, I had gigs coming up. I can't go train for that. And I, I'd have been retired by now, comfortable somewhere, and bored to tears. <laughs> I had the time of my life and started with the 60s. Everything I, I looked at and did, every, all my friends that came along. I mean, you know, a few exceptions. I mean, you run into people that are not quite right, but boy. I And I was lucky enough to be in bands that pretty much stayed together for quite a long period of time, you know. And so my band's pretty much stuck together, including the Delgado Brothers, the Ambertones, and then anybody that was, I was with in Hawaii. And then my son just came along, and next thing you know, I'm, we're keeping the Del Delgado tradition alive. Tell you, man. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, thanks for doing the show, man. Oh, my pleasure. I, I was a little nervous about doing this thing. I, I'm, as you can tell, I'm kind of relaxed right now. Yeah. Yeah. You were worried about doing an hour. I think you've done over an hour. Yeah, has it been? Okay. Oh, yeah. awesome. But uh, you, you bring back, you're right, you brought back a lot of memories for me. And believe me, when you start thinking almost 60 years ago, what you were doing, it just, you know, it's a moment. And I appreciate it. Thank you Thank so you. much. You're welcome. For all you do, by the way. You, you're not just talk, talking to our bands and my brothers. You're talking to all the people that are important. And, those, and that's, I bet you all those guys feel good. Wow, I'm glad he's digging this up. Because otherwise, some of those memories are dead, you know? That's right. That's right. You know, it's, it's funny because in some ways, it doesn't feel like 60 years ago, right? In some ways, it feels like very recent. It's like Still. yesterday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And whoever's listening to this, thank you so much for the Ambertone days. And you guys made our lives just about us. At, at, the age, at that age, we had no idea that we were having that much fun. Thank you. Cool. See you next time, Eddie. All right. Thank you, buddy.